Welcome back, wannabes and creators, to The Business of Art, the podcast that demystifies business for artists. And today on the show, I have Jeff Goins. Jeff is most famous for his national bestseller, The Art of Work. And I have him on the show today to talk about one of my favorite topics and the title to his latest book, Real Artists Don't Starve. Before I do that, I want to give you something for free. For the past year or so, I've been talking about my first nonfiction book, Sell Your Soul, How to Build Your Creative Career. Well, we're launching it in September, and until then, and right now especially, you are able to get the first chapter for free by going to GoSellYourSoul.com. This chapter is all about creating great content. It deals with rejection, with getting up off the mat, with dealing with criticism, and all of the things that you need to know to make content again and again and again. The other chapters deal with the basics of sales, how to build your audience from scratch, making a profit at live shows, and launching a product successfully, whether it's on Kickstarter, Amazon, or anywhere else. These are tried and true, timeless tactics that you can use to build your creative career today. I don't say this often, but if you are listening to this show, there is a 100% chance that you should go to GoSellYourSoul.com and pick it up today. That's GoSellYourSoul.com and pick up the first chapter today. It's all about making great content and look out for the book in its entirety when we launch it in September. All right, now that that's out of the way, we can get on with the show. Take it away, Jeff. Tell us what you're passionate about these days. I am and have been for a long time passionate about helping creative work get the attention it deserves. I don't think that the world's best art, the world's best writing, our most significant significant contributions automatically get the attention that they deserve. And that bothers me. And so I've spent the last several years trying to make that wrong right. And uh, so you've been studying this for a few years. And what have you found that is the main underlying causes of why it's like the best and brightest aren't getting the attention they deserve? I think uh, that I, I think we assume that good work necessarily gets its due without having to understand the the other skills that you need to make creative work succeed. So, you know, if I'm an artist, um, I think I can just sort of dedicate myself to my craft and be the best artist possible. And then somehow, without worrying about marketing or business, uh, I'm going to get attention to my work and be able to make money off of it. And as a writer, uh, which I've been doing in a variety of forms for the past 15 years, um, it just turns out that's not true, and um, the people that I see really thriving as creatives, they've learned – not necessarily to master, but they've learned how to uh, you know, be, become functional at the basic business skills you need to uh, make money off of your art, and I use that um, in air quotes. And the people who don't, who could have amazing talent, the starving artists, are those who are unwilling to learn kind of these basic skills to take your art and turn it into a business. And so I really think it comes down to, uh, one, awareness. Am I aware that I need something other than my creative skill to succeed in this? And, and as a professional, I would say, yes, you do. And then second is mindset. I think a lot of people don't even think they have the capacity to, you know, say if I'm an artist, uh, learn how to be good at business. And I also think, you know, I think that's not true as well. Yeah, you know, uh, we were talking before we went on that I was at Denver Comic Con this weekend, and you know, we sold out in two days uh, of a three day show, and people would come up and say I could never do that, and I was like, that's patently untrue. Like (laughs) I. Uh, for most of my life have been wholly unlikable as a person. And I, <laughs> I, I talked, I, I found uh, Michael Haig a while ago and other people talking about the attractive character and how you have to like present yourself and how to actually sell things and the mechanics of sales started looking at business. And I was like, you know, it's not complicated. This stuff is not complicated. It's very hard 
to do and continue to do right and to make sure that you're doing it properly. But as far as complicated goes, I think some of uh, some of the best salesmen I've ever met have been the least complicated people that I've ever known. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, sometimes the least educated, you know, like it's not it's not necessarily something that you learn in school or at, you know, an uh, uh, Ivy League institution, which should be good news because most of us didn't go to places like that. And and if we did, like, that's OK. But if we didn't, then we're like most people and we're still not excluded from succeeding. And I think this sort of thing is like any like basic skill you need to get by in life. So recently I was having a conversation and somebody said, um, yeah, we're talking about my my new book and this idea of like, do artists really have to starve or, you know, can they make a living off of their creative work? And And I believe they can. And this person said, but like, what if you just don't get business, which is kind of what that person said to you at Comic-Con, like, I could never do that. And I think mindset is important. I think that person was actually telling you the truth, Russell, because if you think you can't, you won't. And you talked about the importance of going from being unlikable to likable. And you did, you know, and it didn't require cosmetic surgery, you know, like it required you to present uh, a different person, which is just really you thinking differently and then acting differently and and it's amazing how people um, can receive you differently and so when somebody says to me well i i don't possess the abilities the capacity to do that like i just think contextually maybe that makes sense but if you change the context it doesn't make sense so if you know you're i don't know at a personal finance uh uh event you know because you like you don't want to be in debt anymore and somebody is like you know you can get out of debt and you're going like Wait, but I just don't really – what if you just can't balance a checkbook? Well, you learn, right? Like these are acquisitive skills. You can learn them. I'm not talking about becoming the world's best dot, dot, dot. I think every artist has the capacity to learn the basic business skills required to make them very successful at what they do. And, and as you said – it's not like it's not impossible. These are all skills that we can acquire, and and it doesn't um, erase the fact that some people may be prodigies at this. Like I'm not telling you to be, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg or something. Uh, I'm just saying, like, if you learn basic skills that allow you to get your work out there and get paid for it, you're going to do very well. But it does begin with kind of a mindset shift. Uh, do you think this is even possible for you to do? And if so, then you know we can move forward. If not, I mean, game over. Right, exactly. I was uh, my wife picked me up for the airport last night, and we were talking about the conversation that we would, that I just said, and she's like, "Well, I could never do that." I'm like, uh, "She works with children, and part of her, to, part of her job is to not react when they like hit her in the face because they're children." <laughs> right. And I was like. So I could never – like you saying you could never be successful as a writer and like have a career is like me saying I could never not be hit by a kid and not like deck them right back. <laughs> like it is a learned skill. Like you right. really wanted to be uh, – to work with kids and so you learned the skills necessary. They're not necessarily complicated skills. Like the skill is basically when a kid hits you, you don't hit them. That's the whole <laughs> skill. There's a lot of hard parts about that. But the only reason that you were able to learn that skill is because you really, really wanted to work with kids. You do not want to be hit in the face, but you do want to work with the children. You understand that's an ancillary byproduct. And so that's my feeling when I talk about learning these skills. I just want to sit in a room and write. It's all I want to do. I'm mm -hmm. sure like that's probably what you want to do at the end of the day too. But yeah. like in order to necessitate to, to be able to write full time, you have to do all of these other things, building an audience and catering to them and learning marketing and going out, all of the stuff that any other business would have to do. I always say – when, when artists come to me and they say, well, I don't want to learn these business skills, like, do you think that you're different than an electrician? Because an electrician just really wants to wire stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a mechanic just wants to work with cars. But when they own a business, 
they have to do all of the other stuff that takes them away from running that business too. Yep. Yeah, and and as somebody told me recently, if you're a writer, you're in business. I mean, if you want to do this on any professional level, because at like the most basic level, you are uh, writing for a living, articles, books, whatever, and uh, you're doing that probably as a contractor, you know, a 1099 uh, contractor, and you're getting checks or direct deposit. You know, hopefully cash is coming in or is supposed to come in. You're a business. You're an entity, right? You are now responsible for um, managing those resources and uh, you know, staying in the black so that you can can continue to operate. And all that means is that you write and get paid. And if you are doing that or you want to do that, you have a business. And so now it's a question of what are the skills that I need to do this well? And I think you should think of it, you know, in any other context. Like, what are the things I need to do to get to the thing that I really want to do? Right. So I like eating. Uh, because food tastes good and it keeps me alive, but I don't have to become like the world's best chef, right? I mean, I think we really get caught up in like, is the end justifying the means? Like if the end is strong enough, can I muscle my way through the means? And I have learned how to cook things, um, not at a master level because I like things tasting good and not starving to death. And those two things are stronger than my aversion to cooking, for example. And, and I've actually learned that I enjoy some of these things more than I thought I would. And I think that's a fascinating thing about business, particularly with artists and creatives of all type, is you sometimes find that there are parts of it that you really enjoy and are really good at that even feel creative. But because sometimes we have this um, you know, disgust or fear of money or the business side of things, we think it's going to taint our art. Uh, we don't even open ourselves up to learning those skills. But I found certain parts of it like marketing – uh, are really enjoyable to me because all marketing to me is practicing in public. It's uh, sharing a piece of my work every single day um, in, a, in a place where somebody can find it. Like this is marketing and I'm talking about these ideas and I'm doing it in a way that is fun for me. I like talking. Um, and, you know, My wife will attest to that. And, and it feels creative and it's not writing but it's talking about writing and um, that's fun for me too and I never would have learned that if I didn't at least – open myself up to the possibility that these are things that I need to be doing to get my art out there. I think that is uh, such a great point because uh, I I was the stereotypical person who just said the same stuff that like my, this podcast is really just for me and when I was 28 you know, telling myself <laughs> right. to wake up. Sure. Like, because I think everyone goes through that point where they go, well, my work is going to be so good that it's going to speak for itself. And then you look at yourself seven years later and you're like, oh, God. And you're like, please don't be me. Just like understand that if you are a great writer, you are now competing with Stephen King and like Michael Crichton and uh, and uh, David Baldacci and all these other writers who are way ahead of you. And best case scenario, you're now in the major leagues there and now you have to stand out. And when you take on all of these things, you find out, like, I really like negotiating contracts. I did not know mm. I would like negotiating yeah, contracts. Right. That's amazing. I think it's fantastic. I, I, yeah. I sit down with somebody else and we talk about the thing and then I make – and then we go back and forth. And at the end of the day, like, it's like a – it can be a fun experience. It's not always a fun experience, right. but, like, it can be very enjoyable. And like you said, like, this podcast, I said the first time I did it, Oh, I guess I'm just going to try it. Like, what is it going to cost? A hundred bucks, 200 bucks. Like get all this thing <laughs> right. set up. Yeah. Uh, and I found that it was incredible. And I, if I didn't try it, like what a hole in my life, if I didn't was able right. not, not able to talk to creatives and have this show and have this outlet, like what a hole I would have in my life because this thing didn't exist. And it only exists because I was like, I guess I got to do some marketing and give some value to my audience. <laughs> so I'll try it. And then you find out that you love it. I love that. Yeah. And I mean, this really speaks to an idea that I've been kicking around for a few years now, which is the portfolio life. And I, I heard this from a friend of a friend of a friend. But it's basically the idea that you don't do just one thing in your career. You have a portfolio. Think of it like you know, uh, a 401k or something. And you've got 
uh, all these different stocks, all these different investments. And this is how we spend our time, right? Like um, even Stephen King doesn't sit down and write nine hours a day. Right, like the most prolific authors spend basically three to six hours a day writing. It is grueling work. And then what are they doing the rest of the time? They're doing other things. And I found it very freeing when I started writing and I was like, well, I've got to do the blogging thing to promote the work. And I guess I got to do speaking and I, I have this opportunity to start a business over here. And I kind of hodgepodge all these things together. And there was a point where I felt like I was a jack of all trades, but a master of none. And I, I was really conflicted about that. And I called a friend of mine, Keith in Atlanta, who, um, is this marketing guy for a medical company and also writes poetry and, uh, advises creatives and, um, loves, Japanese culture and goes hiking, you know, it's <laughs> like all these different things and a very Renaissance kind of guy. And I said, should I be the writer or should I be like the business guy? Should I be the marketer or should I be the speaker? Like, I feel like I got to pick something. And he's like, who says you have to pick something? He goes, you're living a portfolio life and your job is to manage the portfolio, not the one thing. The one thing is the portfolio. It is this collection of a handful of things that you do well that when you combine them makes your work really, really unique. And ever since I, you know, heard that advice, that felt like a, a breath of fresh air. All of a sudden, I don't have to be the world's best writer. I want to be really good. I want to be great. Um, but I'm the best writer who has a blog who talks about this subject in this way. And what you find as you begin to pull all this stuff together is you find a unique voice. And then, you know, talking about the business side of things, uh, you can also do the thing that so many people struggle with is you have these multiple streams of income, uh, which can create some stability and security. Whereas, you know, somebody just says, I want to write. I want to be the best writer ever. And I've got to make a full time living off of my writing. That doesn't really avail you to other opportunities where you may find out I really like negotiating or I'm really good at speaking or podcasting is, you know, right up my alley and I didn't even realize it. And these open other, you know, opportunities to make money as well. And at the end of the day, I did the writing eight hours a day thing and it, it got old. I realized I, I need to have some variety and this is actually what works best for me. Not being a jack of all trades, but becoming a master of some. Right. And I love that. And I love when you talked about your unique voice. And I think this is a good transition point into the book that, uh, that you just released. The, um, the one that I was in the launch team for, The Real Artists Don't Starve, uh, because there's a part in this book that talks about your audience. And to me, this is like the key to the whole thing is if you can, if you develop your unique voice, you'll be able to speak to a certain percentage of an audience. It won't be everybody. Like mm -hmm. you won't connect. I won't connect with when I go to a room and speak with uh, to speak to 100 people. I am real happy if 10 of those people are moved by like the thing that I'm saying, because just everyone won't connect with everybody's unique voice and what they're telling telling them. I give practical, strategic advice. The people that like practical, strategic, step by step advice are going to really respond and people that want to be like spoken to in that hard selling way will respond, but the other people will respond to somebody else. And uh, I, I would love for you to speak a little bit about finding your audience, because I think if, for me, if, if, if more artists focused on finding the audience and dealing with the people that do respond to their work, they would have a whole heck of a lot more fun doing this. Yeah, it's, it's a tough thing, because uh, like, I think you want everybody to like your work. Until you realize the kind of work that everybody likes is not that interesting. It's certainly not interesting to me. And like every time I go, man, I wish I had more book sales or I wish I had more traffic to my website, I then ask myself a question, well, what do you really want? Because if you wanted more eyeballs, you could write about things that more people cared about. Like you could start a fashion blog, right? Like you could um, write about – you could write books about celebrities. Like if that's what you really wanted was just more attention for the sake of attention, then you would chase it at the cost of you know your message. But the truth is we want to have our cake and eat it too. We want to write about things that matter to us. We want to create things that matter to us. Um, and we also want lots and lots of people to care about those things. And those aren't mutually exclusive, but they're 
there's tension there and there's there's overlap. Like I want to write about the things that I care about that are also going to be helpful and interesting to other people. And the only way that you find out where that overlap is is by kind of bouncing around in, in the two different spheres. Like on one hand, I'm going to write about things that are only interesting to me that nobody else cares about or very few people care about. I've done that. I've written an entire book about things that were interesting to me and it didn't sell well and I got it out of my system and I thought I'm just going to create a piece of art for the sake of art and just put it out there and and trust that good work will get the attention it deserves. And it didn't. And I I said I'll just be happy if I write the best book possible. And I did and it's a great book and I go back and read it. Like I'll pick it up and go, is, is this as good as I thought it was? And I pick it up and I go, wow, it's still – I don't hate it and that's a good sign for a writer. And uh, – but it didn't work you know. and I was surprised at how disappointed I was and I realized, OK, I'm not being honest here. I don't want to just create great work that I believe in. I want to know that it's resonating with people. And so the next – you know. Extreme was well. I'm going to write in the sphere of what's popular, and I did that for a little while, and that wasn't that was unsatisfying in a different way. I wasn't disappointed, but I kind of felt like a fake. Uh, uh, you know, it's this idea that you know many of us will climb a ladder in life only to realize it's leaning against the wrong wall. It's success at the wrong thing, and you're all of a sudden you get known for something that you don't want to be known for. And so I found you know the way to kind of stay in my lane, so to speak, is to write about things that resonate with me and through, through the multitude of channels that exist today, social media, uh, blogs, Instagram, you know, you name it, my email newsletter list, I can get feedback from my audience while I'm working on something and know, you know, know kind of where I'm at and, and know if I'm writing about something that not only resonates with me, but resonates with other people. And so I like what you said, Russell, about speaking to a room and, and hoping to connect with uh, a few. My my problem is the opposite. I'll, I'll write a book, and I was looking at the um, the reviews for Real Artists Don't Starve uh, the other day, and I got my first one star review. And like it's bound to happen. But I was like I was like dreading it because a friend of mine was like, "Hey, do you have any negative reviews yet?" I'm like, "No, I don't. Totally don't." And then I went on like a Sunday afternoon and checked the Amazon page, and there it was, one star review, and it was like one of the most boring books I ever read. Um, but I, I actually went and shared this on Instagram because I thought it was really interesting. I read it first thing always when you read criticism. Hey, that hurt my feelings. Like I, I, I don't like that this was a boring book for you. So sorry. Um, but then I read the review and I was like. Oh yeah, like there's nothing that I would have changed about this book to make this person happier with what I created. And and the person said, "You told too many stories." And I was like, that was the whole point of the book was to tell lots of stories. So that's like reading a novel and saying, mm, you know, I this would be good if there weren't any characters or a plot." Well, that like that was the whole reason I wrote this thing. And and so I shared it on Instagram. One, whenever I get negative feedback, I like to kind of bring it to the light because I think it takes away some of the sting and you don't hide and sort of obsess over it. And then two, I said, hey, this is actually a really good review because if you don't like stories, you shouldn't read this book because it's a lot of stories and it will bore you. I don't understand how stories are boring to people, like facts and figures and bullet points. I get how that's boring, but stories? Uh, but if that bores you, you know, then don't read this book. And so I think when you're building an audience, it's good to think about the line. Like what is the line that I'm going to draw where you basically say, hey, you're with me or you're not with me? And it doesn't have to be – like you don't have to be mean or rude about this, but there are just certain things that we believe. You know, it, Call it a worldview. Call it values. There are things that you believe that make you who you are and make your message interesting to at least a few people and – in order for you to attract the people who really need that, you have to very clearly draw a line and say, this is who this is for and this is who this is not for. And when you do that well versus trying to please everybody, your work becomes immediately attractive. Yeah, and so uh, when I picked – when I read this book, I, 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 f I felt like it was for an artist who did not believe they didn't have to starve – and you had to walk them baby steps through all of these examples that, like, it's okay to not starve. And here are people who, like, have not starved also so that by the end somebody has the epiphany that, like, oh, I totally 
don't want, I totally don't have to starve, but you can't do that. For instance, my upcoming book is all about like, once you realize you don't have to starve, when you're floundering through a thousand business books, here are the 50 things that you need to do to make sure that you're like that putting in place to make sure that you know what to do. But I feel like when I read this, this was like the prequel to my book. Yeah, I love that. I'm honored that you said that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean that – like I like to write why books. This is a book about why you don't have to starve, including some practical things that you can do at a conceptual level. Um, but I wanted to write a timeless book about why as a creative person you can make a living off of your creative gifts. You don't have to starve for it. And you're absolutely right, Russell. It was – I was I was making a case, and to build a case, you need – uh, data and I had you know data I had studies and research in there. You need illustrations to humanize. You need stories, lots and lots of stories, so that people don't think you're cherry picking. I mean, there's over a hundred stories in the book, and uh, the point of that is to be like like a lawyer in a court of law. I'm trying to build a case, so by the very end, I go, look, you're the jury. You get to decide. Do you have to starve or not? And at the end of the book, I just I leave the choice in. Uh, the reader's uh, hands and, and mine saying being a starving artist is no longer a necessity. It's a choice, not a necessary condition of doing creative work. So whether or not you starve, that's up to you. Right. And on top of that, like when you're making a case and you have a room full of people who read like the Da Vinci story or the writer story <laughs> right. and go, yeah, but yeah. I'm a sculptor. There's nothing in there for me. And right. so you have to have a ton That's of right. stories so that the guy who like is a beatnik poet goes, oh, there's a story for me too. <laughs> Otherwise, they're going to be able to rationalize it away. Right. to like, well, there's 99 stories and none of them specifically <laughs> spoke to me living in Alaska and like writing cra- uh, uh, poems on crayons. Yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, I appreciate you noticing that cuz you think about that stuff when you're trying to build a case like how many stories of men are there? How many stories of women? How many contemporary stories? How many stories from the past 100 years, past 500 years? I wanted to illustrate timeless strategies for how creative people have always succeeded for the past 500 years. So good economy, bad economy, uh, sculptor, painter, uh, actor, dancer, creative entrepreneur, puppeteer, you name it. Um, I wanted to like in a very diverse way um, make a well-rounded argument. Whatever you think of when you think of the word artist, you don't have to starve to do your most creative, most significant work. All right, and – so my whole ethos is like if you can if we can't get to the point where you believe that you're an art as a business, you shouldn't even listen to this. You shouldn't even read this ne- the, the the book that I put out there or read a lot of the tactics stuff. Like not these these interviews are for that audience who like wants to hear from like the creative because they're not quite sure. So like these interviews are part of like I feel like a great ac- uh, accompaniment to this book because they show hundreds of different people and all sorts of creative careers and how they build their successful parts. But I also do these live videos, which are tactical and practical. And I'm like, if you can't get through the interview and get to the point where like you believe that you are ready to like make your art a business, then don't even come. This is like step two. So like step one, you, uh, you, I bring on all sorts of guests, including marketers and entrepreneurs and all sorts of other people so that they can – at some point, they'll have their own epiphany because to me – well, not just to me, but like many people have said. But to me, uh, you know, you're not going to get anywhere if you're telling somebody what the epiphany is. Mm-hmm. But if you can create an environment where like they are able to have their own epiphany – then like they they actually will make the change because it's them wanting to make the change, which is what I think is so uh, so special about this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I love that and, and agree. Um, like I said before, if you think you can't, you won't. And uh, in the book, I spend the first third of it talking about mindset. It is uh, as a former starving artist, I think it's really 
important. And look, I, I'm not saying like you've got to sort of like Tony Robbins yourself into like getting really psyched up and think, saying I can do anything. Like I think that's cool and I have a lot of respect for Tony, but I have sort of stumbled through my career as a writer full of self-doubt and fear and anxiety. And um, you don't have to have it all together in order to be successful at this. You just have to be willing and you need to not assume that before you begin you're, you've already lost. And I hear so many people do this, Russell. I did this. And I had a, a paradigm shifting conversation about seven years ago when I start, I started on this journey where I was talking to a friend and he asked me what my dream was. And I kind of hemmed and hawed and I wouldn't even, uh, verbalize it because I was afraid. I said, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I really have one of those. Um, I, I think dreams are for flaky people. I've got a job and I'm good with that. And he looked at me and he said, really? And this guy had only known me for two months. He said, because I would have thought just based on what I've seen of you that your dream would be to be a writer. But if you don't have a dream, well, I guess, you know, I guess that's okay. And I said, well, hang on a second. Hang on. Okay, fine. Like I'd like to be a writer someday, but that'll never happen. And he just looked at me and he said, Jeff, you don't have to want to be a writer. You are a writer. You just need to write. And as much as that, you know, may, may sound like a Jedi mind trick, it, it worked. And I realized that in some cases, activity follows identity. That before we can go do something, we have to become someone, at least in our minds. We have to believe that it is at least possible to be this thing, to be this person, author, artist, entrepreneur, that we never thought we could be. And then as we begin to believe it, I think the next step is to behave like it. And then eventually you become it. And that is a really beautiful transformation. But it doesn't happen if from the outset you just go, I can't, I can't, I can't. It won't work. I think that is uh, – that. I think that's beautiful because when people uh... – I, I don't know. Do you get this point where people go, well, how, like I could never be where you are. And you're just like, I don't even know how, like, I don't even know like how I got here. I just did the work for a long time and kept like moving, like uh, moving cups around and like moving to the place <laughs> that was good. And like, eventually I got here, but like, I think anybody can get here. I just did a lot of work for a long time and like learned. And eventually if you, when I eventually, by doing the work for long enough, I kind of could see the code behind the Matrix. Did you ever watch the Matrix? Of course. I mean, what, right, kind, so of question, what kind of question is that? Well, I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> Some people may have said no, but the second movie, I know is not as good as the first yeah, one, but that conversation yeah. with the architect at the end like really got to me. And I think about it all the time. You know when he says, like, we've destroyed Zion a bunch of times and we've gotten extremely yeah. good at it? I'm like, that's how I feel about like this now. It's like, well, I, it's only because I've destroyed Zion a thousand times that like I am as good at doing the thing that I am now because I did the work and I feel like anybody can do the work. Like you should read some of my original writings and some of my, like my, some of my original ideas that I was just going to like magically be found and plucked out of obscurity in DC. And then like from that to now, it's just like, I don't know. I, I like when I used to get advice, it was like I always thought that it was BS because like it was always the same advice is like just do the work and eventually things start happening for you as long as you're doing the work and getting better at like and building an audience and all these things. I don't know. I guess my question is, do, do, do you feel, does that happen to you, too? Or like, do you feel that same way or like how is it different for for you than it was for my experience? I do get asked that question. Um, you know, or, or that, you know, that's, I hear that statement, uh, I can never be where you are. And I would say, you know, the first few years in this journey, I think you experience some success that maybe you never expected. And you kind of want everybody to have that because it, like, you don't feel that special. And you certainly don't want to think you got lucky. Uh, and so you're like, man, everybody can do this. It, like, I didn't think I could do it for a while. And then I did it. And it's not that hard. It takes work, but it's not that hard. And I agree with all that stuff, but I think where I've come to now is um, when somebody says, I can never be where you are, um, there's a few realities happening. One, they may not actually want to be there, right? Um, like I, I try to not compare myself to other people 
Because when I see somebody at some place, I ask myself, do I want the results without the work? Like I don't want to be where Stephen King is. Like he was an addict for like over a decade and nearly lost his family multiple times, wrote many best-selling books, doesn't remember. He was so out of his mind. Um, like I admire what he's done, but he went through hell to get there, a hell of his own creation. I don't I don't want to do that. I don't want to miss out on on these important years of my kids' lives. So no, I, like I, I, I think sometimes I want the result without the process. Uh, I want the achievement without the work. Um, so I mean I think that's a reality. The other thing is – I think we all have different um, abilities and skills and inclinations and even gifts and callings. And um, like at, at the end of the day, um, I may admire somebody's success but like have no desire to do the things that they did to get there. And and just because I'm not, I won't enjoy that. Like I I have a friend who runs a very successful business, um, makes way more money than I do, is more famous than I am. But he has all these people that he manages, and I don't like managing people. I like working with a small team and spending most of my free time writing or by myself or doing doing whatever I want. And so for me, the freedom is greater than you know the fortune. So yeah, for me, there's a lot of different things sort of factoring into that. I do generally think that if you want to do something, you can. It's just a matter of figuring out. Um, what is the path to get there? And, and as you mentioned, Russell, it, it begins by looking at other people who, uh, um, you know, got got where you want to go and, and learning from their examples. But I also think it's important to think about values. Like, what am I willing to not give up to achieve X outcome? Like, I have a family, I'm married. There are certain things that I don't want to give up. Um, you know, time with my family, focus on my kids. Uh, and so if it means I'm a little bit less successful, at least in the way that I understand it, like I, I, I count that cost on a daily basis and I continue to re- remind myself that I've counted it when sometimes I'm feeling jealous or, you know, envious. The other thing is like every time somebody comes up to me and goes, I can never be where you are. I go, where, where am I? Like I, I feel like I'm, lo- I'm still looking at the mountaintop, you know, <laughs> still kind of at the base of the mountain. And it just so happens that there's a few people behind me that are a little bit further down going, what is it like to be up there? I don't know. Like I'm climbing. I'm still trying to get to the summit myself. I love that. All right. So we got to work towards wrapping up. Um, I want to ask you if you could go back and wipe out the last seven years. You talked to yourself seven years ago when yeah. you were that guy who's like, I, I am a writer. And you could give yourself <laughs> one piece of advice to – uh, cut off three, six, nine months, a year of the struggle to get where you are today. What would you tell yourself to make your ascent to where you are, knowing that you're not at the top, a little bit easier? I've been thinking a lot about this kind of question. I've been thinking about like what's more important, um, wisdom or like logic? <laughs> You know, like, like, is it better? To, like, wisdom to me is learning from other people's mistakes and, and successes, and and having the ability to discern right from wrong, good from bad, smart from stupid. Um, but then logic is like the way that you you work that stuff out. You know, so I think it's better to have logic. Anyway, I I I think all that to say, like, the greatest gift that I have received and continue to grow is the ability to understand. Um, what I'm good at, what I like, what I don't like, what fills me up, what drains me. And uh, this may sound like a strange answer, but the gift that I would give myself is I'd go back seven years and I would tell myself to go to counseling, to get a therapist. Because the most important thing that I've learned uh, recently in the past few years uh, from going to counseling just for like – like sometimes people go, why are you going to counseling? Same reason I go to a doctor or a dentist. I want to be healthy. Um, and, and, and the best gift I got was self-awareness. And I think so many people are not self-aware. And so they go, well, I want to do what she's doing. She's not you, right? Like she's, like she doesn't have your strengths and weaknesses and personality and life circumstances. And I don't think we think about that too often. We think about just us and our own little worlds forgetting how much we're interacting with other people and other situations all 
the time, if I could go back and give myself one gift, one practical thing, like do this, become self-aware, whatever that looks like, read more than just business advice books, you know, like read books about, uh, you know, your feelings and your emotions and, and, and who you are as a person. Cause it, it influences everything that we do. And if we don't understand ourselves, we're going to continue to put ourselves in situations that are going to burn us out, stress us out, create angst. And we may, if, if we're not, I mean, I see this happen with very successful friends all the time. They put themselves in the situations because this is what is expected of them. They're dying in those situations. And, and I go, why don't you quit? You know, why don't you get rid of your business? Why don't you stop being famous? Why don't you go, go do something else instead? And they go, I can't. Like, this is what I'm supposed to do. And this is just, I just have to deal with it. That's not being very self-aware, and that's probably being a little bit addicted to your own fame or success. And I think we can all succeed in our own ways, in in ways that are life-giving, um, and and feel like they are in line with our life's purpose, not some something that you know is a cookie cutter definition that fits somebody else's lifestyle and and doesn't work for us. But we have to be self-aware. I love that. I love that. I, I came to the realization a couple of years ago that I just want a small little piece of the internet and like I just I don't want a lot of it. I just want enough to like yeah. be able to like dick around and do whatever I want. And like freedom, <laughs> like you said, yeah. like freedom for me is way more important than seeing my much more successful friends with a lot more money and way more responsibility than me. All right. So um, as uh, one more question before we wrap up, which is uh, – well, maybe I'm just going to give you a platform. I'm not going to ask you a question and say – Ask you to tell my tell my listeners why they should pick up your book. Well, you know, as we said earlier, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe it's not for you. If you don't like stories, um, if you're not willing to at least try to be persuaded, like you don't have to believe it's possible, but you're at least willing to be persuaded that if you're an artist, and I use that term very loosely, writer, creative, cartoonist, comic book, uh, you know, artist. Um, uh, creative entrepreneur, maker, whatever that means to you. Uh, and you, like I, grew up hearing this idea that you're going to have to starve for your art, that this isn't a serious vocation. Um, this is the other side of the story. And we've all heard the story of the starving artist. What we are less acquainted with is the story of the thriving artist. If that sounds interesting, if it sounds exciting to you, as it did to me when I was in my mid to late 20s and a friend said, you can be a writer, like I got really excited because that sounded risky and scary and exciting, then um, you should check it out. I, I will say as someone who uh, is engrossed in creative entrepreneurship and knows a lot of these stories, even just hearing them again – like reinvigorate am I like you're right you don't have to starve for your art because there's a big wall man there's like almost everyone is going to tell you you have to starve for your art like that right. is the norm like that the norm is that people are starving for their art and then they want you to also believe you have to starve for your art and this book to me was an amazing reminder of like no you don't like the most successful artists don't. Yes, there are also successful artists who died penniless, but there are also uh, successful inventors that died penniless. Tesla died penniless and Rand died penniless. Like, but you, that's not just because there are people that have died penniless and starving does not mean that is, is the only choice. Mm -hmm. And I do, I, I really respect at the, at the end of this, where you talk about that, it is a choice. Like you're making a choice by saying you have to starve just like this just like the choice that you can be successful now making the choice that you don't have to starve doesn't mean magically you're going to start making a huge amount of money but it will put you on a path to understanding all of these things and being able to model the success that that like has come before you and we live in a, an amazing time where like you can actually just use the internet and google any writer or artist and get their entire life story and be like, huh, I should probably do some of those things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. So Jeff, um, this is the point where all the people that zoned out come back and like start listening <laughs> again. Um, for those people that have zoned out for the past 45 minutes, cause you're at your writing desk or your art desk, or you've been in traffic. This is the moment where you can, where you impart 
the one piece of wisdom you want them to walk away with from this interview? Yeah. Um, I, I think it comes back to the idea of a choice. You have a choice. Being a starving artist is a choice, not a necessary condition of doing creative work. Um, and the other thing is I wouldn't um, get caught in the whole comparison trap. I learned uh, years ago that there are people that are going to be luckier than I am, at least based on my observation. Wow, like they met that person or were in the right place at the right time. I wish I could have done that. Like there's going to be people that seemingly got luckier than I did. And there's also going to be people that seemingly are much more talented than I am and, and don't have to work as hard to do the things that I find really difficult. And it was at this point that I realized Okay, well, what can I control? What can I do? Well, you can outlast the lucky and you can outwork the lazy. Like you can always do those things. So the people who are talented but maybe a little bit lazy, you could just work harder than them. You can outwork them. That That's that's a thing. And the people who are lucky, like luck doesn't last forever. If they're just riding out their luck, you can outlast them. Just keep showing up. And the thing that I often tell writers especially who are – struggling to stay motivated like what's the one piece of advice that you have don't quit i mean i I know that it's sort of pat advice but so many people get into this a year or two or three years in and go it didn't work out so i'm gonna quit and the way that you stand out from most amateurs and the way you become a professional in anything is you keep showing up and you don't quit until you see the results. I, I can't tell you how important that advice is and was to me, especially as years go on and I see friends dropping off left and right. And I'm like, oh, this is what they're talking about. Like you all come in, especially if you're at the beginning of your career, you all come in at this like you all have equal skill, yeah. maybe equal drive. Yeah. But if you're 10 years on and you have, have developed the skills of putting out stuff and, and you people, almost everyone will drop off. Almost everyone will, and every every creative I've ever met has been like, yeah, I just started doing it, and eventually I had more skill and talent and and uh, a bigger network than anybody else because like the other people that had the equal skill dropped off at year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. Eventually, like I was left with very little competition. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you stick around long enough, and it starts to feel a little bit lonely. And then you realize, oh, this, like this isn't that hard. I just need to not quit, which certainly isn't easy. But I mean, if you start out thinking it's a sprint, um, you're going to get tired really quickly and probably not stick around. Right. Like we talked about at the beginning, it's not complicated, but it is hard. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, uh, if you could tell our uh, listeners how they can find you. Uh, also, I will plug the Portfolio Life. It's a great podcast. If you like oh, this one, go check out the Portfolio Life, which uh, Jeff has uh, has great guests on uh, all of the time. Uh, but yeah, let them know where they can find you, and then we'll say goodbye. Yeah, thanks, Russell. You can find me at goinswriter.com. That's just my last name, G-O-I-N-S, writer.com. Uh, if you're interested in building an audience, which we talked about at the beginning, um, I have a free ebook on my website about the beginner's guide to building an audience using blogging and social media and stuff. And you can find that at goinswriter.com just on the homepage. And the book is Real Artists Don't Starve. It's available wherever books are sold. If you do pick up a copy, go to don'tstarve.com and get some uh, free bonuses just for picking up the, the book. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming on, and we'll talk to you soon. Oh, thank you. So I hope you enjoyed that interview with Jeff Goins. If you did, go pick up Real Artists Don't Starve. It is a great book and is a great way to get your mindset right so you can do all of the other things that you need to do to create a business around your art. And make sure to find Jeff online and say thank you. Before we get out of here today, I just want to remind you to go and pick up your free first chapter of my new book, Sell Your Soul, How to Build Your Creative Career at GoSellYourSoul.com. It's all about how to create and make great content again and again and again. And then when we launch the book in September, the other four chapters are all about the basics of sales, building an audience from scratch, making a profit at live shows, and finally, how to launch a successful product. 
So head on over to GoSellYourSoul.com and pick up the first chapter for free today. Don't forget to join our free Facebook group at WritingAndSellingCommunity.com. And please, if you can, leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get this podcast. Thanks a lot, wannabes and creators. I will see you next time.